we are in Acts chapter 5, and, and last week we took a break from our journey through the book of Acts, because if you're new here, that's what we do. We go through a book of the Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and we took a break last week to celebrate the awesome birth of Christ. We had our candlelight service, but this week and next week, our last two weeks before the end of the year, I want to finish up Acts chapter 5, all right? That's my goal. And so we're beginning in Acts chapter 5, verse 12. And we covered right before Christmas, our Christmas service, we, we covered the first 11 verses in Acts chapter 5. And just to kind of give you a reminder of what happens in the beginning of Acts chapter 5, it's sort of this very, um, I don't know, intense, I guess, heavy section of the book of Acts where we have these two individuals who are numbered with the Christians. There's Ananias and Sapphira. Remember those two, right? They did something deceptive. Now, I'm not going to go into details. You can listen to the sermon from that week or, or read it yourself. But, but they did something uh, deceptive. They did something that kind of um, boosts their own prestige, so to say, to, to kind of make themselves have this image of spirituality when in reality it wasn't true. And if you remember, they both ended up dead, right? You, and so when thinking about that, you would be excused if you were to look at that and think, man, God's judgment was on the church. God, you know, he, he, the early church, he's not pleased with them. He's killing off people, right? You can look at that and very well look at it and be like, man, God, God's not pleased with them. God's hand is off the early church. People are dying, right? But if you remember, Luke is the author of Acts, and he was also the, the, the author of the Gospel of Luke. And, and when we're reading this book that he, that he wrote, and... and what we read next and what we're going to read in, in Acts chapter 5, it, Luke very much doesn't want us to think that. Doesn't want us to have the impression that God's hand is off the early church or, or that he's mad or upset at them because of the Ananias and Sapphira thing. Because here as we begin in verse 12, uh, this is immediately after the Ananias and Sapphira thing. And we're going to see that God is actually truly still blessing the early church. And so let me just open up in prayer and then we'll dive in. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you. Lord, we thank you for your word and thank you for the hope that we have in it. And God, that we, we know that uh, when we come through passages uh, like Ananias and Sapphira, we, we just realized how serious all this is. It's not just adding Jesus to our lives. It, it is, it's surrendering our life, yielding our life to you, God. And so, Lord, more than anything, I just pray that, that anything of me just falls to the ground. Anything of you penetrates the hearts. And, Lord, we just, we just open up your hearts and minds to what you have for us this morning uh, as we continue through Acts chapter 5. So I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So let's dive in, starting at verse 12. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done amongst the people. And they were with one accord in Solomon's porch. And so we see right there, that very first verse of what we're covering this week, verse 12, that God is still very much at work, right? He's not, you know, like I said before, he's not against the church now. It says, through the hands of the apostles, what happens? Many signs and wonders were done amongst the people. And again, they prayed in Acts chapter 4. If you remember, if you look at Acts chapter 4, they prayed for God to continue to do his healing work and, and, what, and that's what he does. He did it. That's what he's doing. And notice there's another sign and wonder right there in verse 12. This one might be seem a little less obvious, but I think it's one nonetheless. It says that they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Now, this isn't the first time we've, we've heard that phrase, one accord. We've covered this before. We've seen a number of times in the book of Luke that they've been in one accord, right? And that basically means that they were in unity. That's what that one accord means. There was a unity with one another. And I think that's a miracle because, I mean, think about it. Someone just died in the church, right? Ananias and Sapphira just died. And you could just imagine... You know, when something like that happens in a church, I mean, luckily no one's died here, but when dramatic things happen in a church, a lot of times there, there is, you know, this, this criticism. There's this displeasure that happens and, and, and disunity arises in the church. <coughs> Excuse me. And you can just imagine 
I mean, I just, you, you know me. I like to put my, my, my shoes, you know, put myself in their shoes a little bit here. I can just imagine, you know, them being a little discord with, with this. You know, Bartholomew saying, like, why did you handle Ananias that way? And then another person maybe in the church is like, how did this happen? These two people died. What in, what in the world? But that's not what happened. They were with one accord. They were all together remaining, even though Ananias and Sapphira just died. Even though something dramatic like that happened, it was actually used to draw people closer to God, not further away, which is an amazing thing that God is doing within the early church. And I'm not trying to apply for a... Uh-oh, the phone's going off. That's good. <laughs> I'm not trying to apply for a moment that the early church was perfect, right? That, you know, they got rid of Ananias and Sapphira, and now all of a sudden the church is pure, it's perfect. I don't, I don't think that's right. I don't, I don't think there was, I think there was more people that needed to, you know, be corrected and whatnot. But, but I think Ananias and Sapphira weren't the only two bad apples. The church is not perfectly pure, but God is moving in a wonderful way, and the purity and the power of the early church is evidence of that. And God was blessing them with signs and wonders through the apostles' hands. And here we're not told exactly what the signs and wonders are, at least not in this verse. We're not told. I mean, presumably it's the things we've already seen, right, in the book of Acts and in the gospel. We've seen deliverance of demon-possessed people. We've seen healings. We've seen all these things. And we've even seen unusual blessings in certain ways. And it just continues on. Look at verse 13 and 14. It says, Yet none of the rest dared to join them, but the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. And so God was clearly moving in the church. But I want us to look at that just for a moment. I mean, look at verse 13 and 14, because I, I think it, it kind of, you can kind of look at that and say, well, that contradicts each other. That contra- that's a contradiction. Because in verse 13, it says, none of the rest dared to join them, right? And then in verse 14, it says that the church kept growing. And so was it that no one joined them, or did the church keep growing? See, you see how that's kind of a contradiction there? And so I think how we can answer this, I think there was many people who came to believe in Jesus as their Lord and Savior, but maybe they just didn't add themselves to the church, so to speak, the, the, like the community that they were in, they were sharing all this. Maybe they, they believed and they just in their own homes doing their own thing. That's, that's how I can see that coming to fruition. But, we, but this also shows us that no one joined them lightly. It wasn't just like, uh, you know, I'll believe in Jesus. Sure, that, that's, that seems cool. That seems like a cool thing to do. That's not how it was. I mean, think about it. Someone just died, right? And so you can just think of just the integrity and the impurity of the church. And everybody knew that it was a serious thing to call upon the name of the Lord, be a follower of Jesus. And you would have to admit, an Ananias and Sapphira type incident would, you know, reduce the level of just casual people coming to know the Lord. You know, I mean, you wouldn't just say, well, you know, I'll, I'll be a follower of Jesus when someone's croaking over and dying, right? I mean, you can kind of, you can kind of see that, right? And so you would, you would have to admit that. But the believers, it says, it continued to be added to the numbers. Added to the Lord, I should say. Not to the numbers, to the Lord. The church kept growing. And so Why? Why did the church keep growing? Why wasn't there discord? Why wasn't there all this stuff? Well, let me tell you why. It's because the Holy Spirit was at work. The Spirit of God was moving with power. And I think that's an incredible thing. That is the most incredible thing. We, you know, we often think, you know, how do we, or we think, what do we want to do if we want to add more Christians? If we want, I mean, if I were to ask you to raise your hand, uh, who wants more Christian, people to become Christians? More, more Christians, right? Everybody would raise their hand. Is a Christian say, yes, we want more people to become a Christian. And I think if I were to ask that question, we'd all raise our hands, right? I would hope so. And, and we think that if we want more people to become a Christian, that the way that happens is to lower the bar, so to speak. Make it easy for, for people to become Christians. If we made it easy then more people would, would accept it. More people would come to Christ if it, if it was easy. And, and we, but we find the opposite is true when we look at Scripture and look at this. Because is, is it not? I mean, when you make the bar and, and make it to where it's like a casual thing to become a Christian, 
You're, that you're just kind of adding Jesus to your life, right? When you, I mean, you make the bar low and you want just an extra pep in your life. Like, you know, I, I want to keep all these. I want to keep, keep my dreams, my aspirations, all these things. I want to keep all those things. And I just want to kind of add Jesus to those things because I think he's going to make those things better. I mean, uh, Jesus will just add it to it and make those things better. But we have to realize the, what the Christian life really is, what, what it really means to be a believer of Jesus. If you want to be a follower of Jesus, it's like taking up the cross and denying yourself. Isn't that what Jesus told his disciples while he was on this earth doing his ministry? He said, deny yourself and pick up your cross and follow me. And it's saying, I surrender my life to you. I yield my life to you. All my dreams, all my aspirations, all those things in my life, I lay them down at your feet. And whatever you want to give back to me, you know, it's free from your hands. It all belongs to you anyway. So whatever you want to give to me, but I just want to surrender it all to you. Now, interestingly here, the bar is set very high, right? After Ananias and Sapphira die. The, the people are responding and more and more people are becoming Christians. And again, I think it's a huge mistake we think that to attract people that we, the, to Christianity, we must lower the bar to something insignificant, something casual. Because instead of realizing, friends, we've got to yield our life to him. This is the entire life thing. It's not just Christmas time. It's not just during a season of when everyone else is doing it. It's an everyday thing, day by day. We just got to consider him Lord, master of our life, and surrender it all to him. Because when you realize what it means to be a Christian, it's saying, I surrender my life. And we see that, that, that the bar is actually very high. But I think that's a wonderful and glorious thing, that the bar is high. We say that it didn't hurt the early church. I think that's my whole point in all this. It didn't hurt the early church. It incre increasingly added to the Lord is what it says. And by the way, I kind of mentioned this earlier, but look at verse 14. It says, believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both women and men and women. And notice they weren't added to the church institution. They weren't added to the apostles or, or you know, not even to the movement. You know, in, in Scripture, in Acts, where later on we're going to see that they call this the way. This is the way. But it wasn't that they were added to the way. It says they, they were added to God himself. God himself. They were added in multitudes. And so we see the subtraction of Ananias and Sapphira has no lasting effect on the church. And so look at verse 15 now, and we see God's pleasure was definitely on the church with power. And so that they brought out the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches. And that at least the shadow, get this, the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on them. Also, the multitudes gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem. So it's not just in Jerusalem where the disciples are. They were coming from all over the place, bringing the sick and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. That's a remarkable thing, right? It's God moving in a very powerful way within the early church. God's power was evident with the early church, as described here, that People from surrounding areas. I want you to get this, right? The disciples at this point are only in Jerusalem, and yet the word is getting out so much that people from surrounding areas are bringing in their sick and, and trying to just wait for the apostles, Peter or one of the apostles, to happen, they just happen to walk by. Maybe their shadow would, would pass over them and they would be healed. And, and I think that's very interesting. I think, I think sometimes we can look at that and say, man, what evidence of God's power and God's work in the early church but then there might be some of you in here thinking about, like, th looking at that and be like, well, that's weird. Like, why do they think that with Peter passing over them would, would, would heal them? That's, that seems strange to me. You know, it's strange. I don't know if that's strange to you, but it seems strange, right? But understand this. They were so convinced of the reality of the power of what the Christians believed that they thought that they could be healed by the mere passing of the shadow of Peter. And, but I want you to notice something. If you look carefully there in verse 15 and 16, it, the text doesn't specifically say that they were actually healed when, they, when Peter passed over them. 
It merely tells us that people thought they would be healed and that they did things. They did something, right? They did an action to, to doing that. They, they showed something. The action was taking place based on that belief. And we don't actually know for certain if that person was healed who the shadow of Peter passed over. Maybe so, maybe not. But if we were to take it as true, all right, let, let's say it is true, that that, that, that that was true, that the shadow of Peter passing over someone actually healed that person. Well, how does that happen? Well, let me tell you how I think it happens. I think it happens because the shadow of Peter becomes like a, a trigger point, if you will, like, like a, a, a contact point for that person's faith. And I don't know if that makes sense. It, it, it happens because the shadow of people became a trigger point. And it, 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 because strange things can trigger someone's faith. I don't know if you've ever experienced that, where it's just like something weird happens, and that triggers your faith to, to do something that the Lord has called you to do. I don't, I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but I think that's what's going on here. Strange things can trigger someone's faith. We've seen this before in the Gospel of Luke. You know, in the Gospel of Luke, remember Jesus is moving through that, that big crowd. He's on his way to the synagogue leader's house where his daughter is fell deathly ill. And on the way, there's this huge crowd. And this woman who's been hemorrhaging for a, a long time, doctors can't heal her, sneaks through the crowd, touches the hem of Jesus. And then what happens? Jesus is like, who touched me? And this huge crowd, probably thousands of people there are touching him. And yet this one girl who needs healing touches him, and she's healed. Who touched me? Power went out of me. I can feel it. And that's what happened. She, she was healed. And as soon as she touched him, the hymn of Jesus, she was healed. Now, does anyone think for a moment that there's some magical power in the garment of Jesus? I, I, I don't think that's it. Where, where like... <laughs> Let's say, you know, on, Jesus went to the cross and the Roman guards are fighting for his garments. So they, they cast lots for the garments, right? Uh, does anyone in here think that, that if that Roman guard had like a rash on his arm and they're fighting over that garment or cast lot and he got it and that, that garment touched his arm, that that rash was magic, magically healed? No, that's not how it worked. I don't, I don't think that's how it worked at all. There's no magical powers in the garment of Jesus, and there was no magical power in the shadow of Peter. But I'll tell you where there is power in. There's power in a faith in a living God. That's where the power is. And I think that's where this is, if this was coming, this was happening, that's where it was coming from. Because sometimes, again, strange things can trigger someone's faith. Like that woman reaching out and touching the hem of Jesus' garment. Her faith went from hey, I think maybe God will heal me one day to, I think he's going to heal me now. I'm going to go touch him, and I believe he's going to heal me. You know, when the shadow of Peter passed over someone, if they were healed, and again, I want to reference that, that the, the passage here, the text doesn't specifically say that they were, but let's say, assuming they were, right, it wasn't because there was power in the shadow of Peter. It was because of their faith in the Lord. And sometimes, again, Strange things trigger people's faith. Now, this reminds me of something that, that I should mention kind of before we move on a little bit. Just to mention this idea that, that all spiritual phenomenons that happen cannot be explained or can't be explained easily. I mean, all natural phenomenons in, in the world can be explained. It's definitely not by me, but even by scientists. And I think it's interesting that scientists can explain stuff only so far. Because then after that point, it's just all theory. Because it's like, okay, we, we don't know what, beyond this. This is where, where our knowledge ends. And, and it's the same thing that happens in the spiritual world. Some peop, sometimes people have strange spiritual experiences, and they kind of want to mold and shape God and shape the Word of God based on that experience, right? And, and let me just say, don't do that. Don't, don't do that because maybe I can't explain your experience, but I can explain the Word of God. And, and I'd rather have unexplained experiences and an understanding of the Word of God than to bend the Word of God to fit my experience. Strange things happened. And, you know, me being a pastor, I can't explain every spiritual thing that happens, right? But, but here's the thing. I can look at the fruit of it. 
We, as a pastor and as, as someone of a believer, we can look at the fruit that comes out of that spiritual thing that's happening, right? I, I, and I think that's the more interesting thing anyway. That's where we need to kind of want to examine the fruit of, of, of that spiritual experience. But notice, don't miss the point here in verse 16. They say, and all, they were all healed. The sick people, those people tormented by, by unclean spirits, they were all healed. However God chose to do the healing, they were healed. Whether it was using the shadow of Peter to do the healing or something else, there's no doubt that there was a remarkable work and healing work going on in the early church. And I don't want us to miss the connection here. The church is in a status of a radical purity, right? Uh, after the Ananias and Sapphira thing, you say, yes, there's this radical purity going on. We know the church is not perfect in unity. And, and I don't want to act like that, you know, Ananias and Sapphira were the only bad apples. And once they're gone, everything's perfect. I don't think that. But listen, there was a high level of impurity, a purity. There was a high level in, of integrity and honesty before God. And, and what happened? God was blessing the purity of the church in powerful ways. He was healing people, doing all these things. And I, and I believe that God isn't done doing those things. I think that he still wants to do those things in our midst. And, I, and so I think, first of all, we should recognize that God is doing powerful things all around us, all around us. And, and so if you think that the day of God's healing people is over, then I just want to say I, I respectfully disagree with you. If you think that God's power of freeing demonic oppression is over, then again, I respectfully say you're wrong. Many people today are excited about signs and wonders and the miraculous thing. But here, let me, but let me just be honest. A lot of times when people are interested in miraculous things, they seem, I'm just going to be frank, weird. They seem strange, right? Right? I mean, have you ever flipped on to a, a Christian television and people that are most excited about wonders and works and miraculous things, they seem very strange. They're doing strange things and all this stuff. And, and I got to say, I'm okay with a little strange. I'm okay with that. But we have to realize what's real and what's not real, right? I think, I think that's important. I mean, I think there's a place of truth that we need to consider. Now, when I say place of truth, I don't mean so much of biblical truth. I, I, I take that for granted. I, and, you know, I, I believe, I think if, if they're not teaching biblical truth, then we should just dismiss the, mir the miraculous things, right? I mean, if someone comes in here and they're doing all these miraculous things and yet they're not preaching the gospel, they're not sharing the truth, or they're, or they're saying something that's different from the gospel, then we should ignore it. And so I take that for granted. But what I'm talking about when we talk about when we talk about this, this uh, place of truth, I'm talking about what is true, right? What's true? Are, mir are miracles really happening or are they not, right? That's, that's the big question when we see these things. Are they really happening or are they not? They, they, they'll say that someone is raised from the dead when they're really not. They'll say that someone's healed when they're really not. And I, I think a lot of times amongst Christians, amongst Christian groups, there's a lot of pretending going on when it comes to miraculous things. And I think we need to be real about this. We need to realize that, that that's happening, that when God's moving, people are doing strange things. When God really does something miraculous, we should shout it from the rooftops, no doubt about it. We should tell people but we need to be honest about what does and what does not happen, right? And so the place of truth is very important to me. Another thing that's important to me is a place of integrity. The place of integrity. Now, now what do I mean by a place of integrity? Uh, it, does, that, does that person have integrity in their theology? And, and more specifically, uh, what, what is their theology of suffering? What is, because, you know, it, you see, unless they believe that every time they pray that a miracle happens, that a healing happens. And by the way, if, if that happens to you, let me just shake your hand and have you pray for me because 100% is going to happen. That's awesome. A, a miracle's coming. 
But unless you believe that a miracle always happens when you pray, then you have to deal with this truth. What do you do when it doesn't come true? What, what do you do when the miracle doesn't come, right? I think that's the more hard thing to deal with as a Christian and as, as a person in general. What do you do? And then the, those questions pop in your mind. Has God abandoned me? Is God on your side when, when the miracle does happen? Is God against you when the miracle doesn't happen? And all these things. Does God, but maybe God wants to do a different work. A different work. Another work. You know, we see, you see what I'm saying? We have to deal with this. There's no getting around this. We have to deal with this. And if there's a, a, a lot of weirdness or strangeness amongst people regarding the moving of God, I, th- I think that's just a, a normal thing. It, it's been my experience, though, that it's probably coming from people and not the Lord. All right? That's just my experience. I mean, we have to understand this. God can really be moving, doing this miraculous thing, this awesome work, and there's just the strangeness, and then often the strangeness is coming from people and not from God. For example, I was actually researching some of this, and I, and I found some kind of, kind of interesting things that I want to share with you this morning. Uh, for some years ago, there was a great fuss over a church, over this whole phenomenon of people barking in the Spirit. They're barking like dogs in the, in the Spirit. And the idea is that when the Holy Spirit comes upon the person in such a powerful way, that that person would start to begin to bark like a dog. Now, I find that strange. You? That's a little strange. I mean, I, I got to just admit, that's, that's a little strange. And I have, just have to say, based on my experience with, with the Bible and with the Lord and going, you know, I, I just don't think that's Jesus doing that. That's people. I don't think people doing that are, are the devil or evil by any means. Don't hear me say that. I don't think that. I just think that whenever strangeness is coming forth, it's coming forth from the person and not from Jesus. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. And, and, and sometimes we have to realize this. We have to understand this. When God is moving, doing a powerful thing, he's going to do his thing, but then people are going to do their thing. and They might do some strange things regarding what God is doing, right? And by the way, I find this barking thing very interesting, and, and I kind of dug into this a little bit, because I was like, what in the world did this even come from? And so, so I actually did some more research on this barking dog thing, and y- y'all want to hear about it? Okay, I, okay, I, I, I didn't know if I was going to share this or not, but, it, but I do. Um, but this barking thing actually comes, people claiming uh, that it was present during revival times, and specifically during the 19th century called the Cane Ridge Revival. Has anyone ever heard of that? I didn't really know what that was until I started reading about it. But during the Cane Ridge Revivals, they, they talk about these, these old believers were filled with the Holy Spirit and they're barking like dogs in the Spirit all over the place. If you actually research this, though, and actually find out that what it says in the contemporary reports, we actually see that it's all nonsense. It's all just, just hogwash. Is that a word, hogwash? I don't know. It's a southern word. Okay, I'm southern, so hogwash. All right? The closest thing that there is of this kind of documentary uh, history of barking is actually, so it's actually a Presbyterian uh, minister, and he's leaning against a tree. And he's so just broken by his own sin that he's just sobbing. He's crying. He's broken. He's just, oh, my gosh, God. And, and, and I don't know. I mean, I don't know if you've ever heard someone just crying so much or just sniffling. It kind of sounds like a whimpering dog, maybe. Like, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess you can say that. But that, that's the kind of thing that they were doing. And, and, I, and, and, and so... They see that and they take that and this is what it turns into. They were barking like they were barking in the spirit. And, and the story is that this pastor, he, he treed the devil, right? He treed the devil. And so they're barking like dogs, treeing the devil. That's the story that gets passed on through the generations of, of what God was doing. And, and I think about that and I think about this old minister. He's just broken, right? He's just of his sin. He's convicted, and then that's twisted in that way. God's doing a miraculous, powerful thing in that minister's life. And then people react to it and say, oh, he's barking like a dog, treeing the devil. Right? And so you can see how strange things happen when God is moving. People just react in weird ways. And so... Uh, 
And so one thing a pastor once said that, um, that kind of opened my eyes, he, he, he said this, you're, you're not responsible for, for healing that person. That's God's business, right? God's, I, I think sometimes we're almost scared to pray for someone for a healing because, you know, I have the same fears that you guys have. Like, well, what if God doesn't heal this person? And that person's just like, thanks for praying, but nothing happened, right? There's that fear. And, but but I, I believe that what this pastor said, that our responsibility is not the healing, but he says what your responsibility is, is loving them, is loving that person. And so we should pray and trust God to do big things, to do the healing, but we should leave that to his hands. I don't have to worry about the healing. I can't do that. That's God. What I'm responsible for is making sure that person feels loved. Whether or not it is healed, that's up to God. And so pray for it in faith, asking God to do it. Whether or not that happens, it's up to him. But I am responsible for loving that person. And this reminds me to pray in faith and trust that Jesus will do it, but more than anything, to love that person and encourage them in the Lord, especially if it doesn't come, if God doesn't heal them, to, to help pray for them and help them through that, knowing that the Lord's with them, even in that situation, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Well, with God moving in such a dramatic way in the early church, we can see that there might be some pushback. Just like we saw in Acts chapter 4, there's some pushback here starting at verse 17. It says, Then the high priest rose up, and all those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation. And they laid hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. And so once again, we find this opposition rising up against the church, against the early church. You know, I think when we read the book of Luke, and we read uh, this in Acts, we see that Luke gives us this picture of how the early church uh, was just being blessed by God and all these things were happening and God was working in a powerful way. And then he shows what happens essentially in the world, right? And so what's happening in the church then what's happening in the world. And oftentimes when the world is encountered by the church, like in the book of Acts, I mean, and I will say this, not every time, but a, but a lot of times when the world is encountered, encountering the church, there's conflict, right? There's conflict. There's persecution. And by the way, the persecution is not over today. And so when I read things like this, we should remember our persecuted brothers and sisters that are all over the world, that are, that are uh, being abused by people. You know, I, 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 it saddens my heart when I read about leaders in Pakistan you know, being threatened or, or, or leaders, you know, in, in Ethiopia or, or assassination attempts of, of people in, in Turkey and all these things. You know, I, I read the other day of a, a Iranian cleric and he, he called house churches, Christian house churches that were popping up, he, he was calling them works of the enemy. And, and this is what he said. Here's a quote from him. He said, today the global... Uh, uh, Aggressors have accurately planned and invested resources for their purposes. This is why in our country, get this, there's a strong inclination toward Christianity. Now, a couple things point out or like stick out to me about what this guy said. You know, right? It, not just that, that he was against house churches and, and against all those things, but even this Iranian uh, cleric would declare that, they, that something was happening in his country with this Christianity. Now, for him, it was all plans from the West, right? And all these, all these things. And I wish that that was true. I wish that we had plans that, that do all this stuff over there and to spread the gospel and all these things. But, it, but it's not necessarily true. It's actually God. God is doing it. And praise God that he is. Praise God that he is, he is where there's oppression, that God is moving very strongly and very powerfully. And so I hope when you read these things, it just helps you to remember to pray for those being persecuted around the world, right? Even though it doesn't touch us directly in our comfortable places where we live, there's still brothers and sisters around the world that are, are suffering greatly for the name of Jesus. And that's what ha- is happening here in the book of Acts, right? Uh, they were, there's pushback in verse 17 and 18. The apostles are thrown into jail, 
But look what happens in verse 19. So another miraculous thing happens. It says, But at night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. I mean, you read that and you're just like, That's amazing, right? I mean, <laughs> here is these religious leaders that are determined to intimidate and stop the, this preaching. And so what do they do? They throw them in prison. They, they, they don't, and notice they didn't just take a couple of the apostles. Earlier in the book of Acts, we saw that it was Peter and John. And now it's all 12 of them. They took all 12 of them and threw them in prison. And they thought, oh, we're going to stop them now from doing this. But then what happens? God's like, uh-uh. I'm going to send an angel and the angel is going to let them out and so they can keep preaching. And, and that's what happened. It's a remarkable thing. God does a miraculous thing. But here's the thing. That was so easy for God. Realize that, right? God sees them in prison and thinks, you know, I don't want them in there. All right, angel, get them out. Easy. It wasn't, it wasn't challenging. He said, go. I want you to go back to the temple and continue to be the hands and feet of Christ. Continue to spread the word of this life. That was easy for God to do. Easy. But notice the message wasn't, all right, I'm going to let you out of prison. Run for your lives. Go hide. No. That's not what, the, that, that's not what they did. He says, I'm letting you out, but I'm letting you out for, for a purpose. You have a purpose. Go spread the word. Go preach. Now, before we see them preaching on the Temple Mount, I want, I, want to consider, I want you to consider something. I mean, I've already said it a couple of times, but isn't it glorious how easy that is for, for God to do, to release them? And I want them in prison, I'm going to let them out. Get them out. Boom, they're out. Now, I just need to ask, did that always work this way with the apostles? Did angels always get them out of a pickle? No. That, that didn't. It didn't work like that all the time. Now, you can just imagine the apostles at this point. This is great. We never have to worry about persecution. Whenever we get thrown into jail, God's just going to send an angel and let us out. This is awesome. But again, it doesn't, that's not how it worked out, right? Sometimes God miraculously delivered them, but in the end, sometimes he doesn't. I mean, now the rest of the Bible doesn't tell us the exact way that, that uh, these people died, uh, except for a few occasions. But, um, but we do have fairly reliable church history and tradition uh, that miraculous angels did not always deliver them, all right? We, we know that Matthew was beheaded uh, with a sword. Mark died in Alexandria after being dragged through the streets, the city streets. Luke, the guy who wrote the book of Acts, he hung on an olive tree in, Gran in Greece. John, you know, John died a natural death, but that was only after they tried to boil him alive in oil, right? Peter was crucified famously upside down on a, on, in Rome. James was beheaded in Jerusalem. James the Less was thrown from a height and then beaten to death, right? Philip, well, he hung. Bartholomew, he was whipped and beaten to death. Andrew was crucified and, and preached to the top of his voice about Jesus to those who were persecuting him, those who were killing him. Thomas was run through with a spear. Jude was killed with an arrow from an executioner. Matthias, right, was stoned and beheaded, and so was Barnabas. Those are the two guys we've already read about. Matthias was added to the number, and Barnabas was the one who gave away all his stuff in, in Acts chapter 4. And Paul, we haven't actually gotten to Paul yet in the book of Acts, but when we get to Paul, we're going to find out that he's beheaded in Rome. Now, I mentioned all these things, right? All these ways that the apostles died. Does anyone want to tell me that... that God liked the apostles when he was blessing them and getting them out of jail, and he didn't like them when he let them die a martyr's death. No. We know that God was with them in each circumstance, right? And I think this is a very important point that, that we have to comprehend with our own lives. We know that on one hand, God would send an angel and deliver them. We know that God would send an angel and strengthen them in the midst of their trial. And so understand 
I think this is one of the difficulties in our walk as a Christian, in our, in our, in our walk. And this reminds us that God wants to, us to trust him for miraculous things and, and want to see more and more of those things because he still does those things today. But we have to realize that there are times, and more often than not, where God says, you know, my son, my daughter, I'm going to send a supernatural help for you, but not to help deliver you miraculously from your problems, but I am going to strengthen you in the midst of your problems. That's what we have to understand. Sometimes he does it through, sometimes he does it from. But he wants to see us through the end when he's wanting to see us through the, the, our problems, strengthen us through them. And we have to understand these are, are two things that don't conflict with one another. These actually are complement each other in our Christian life. And, and because we should, we should trust God for the miraculous things and trust him for, for that more and more, but also knowing that he has a purpose when he does not deliver with a miraculous hand. By the way, we also see that when God does set us free, that it's for a purpose. He has a reason. It's not just for our own comfort, right? He sent them out to do something, to preach the gospel. And so they're set free to go do this work. Now look at verse 21. And when they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest and those with him and called and called the council together with the elders and the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. Now I read that and I was like, they're in total denial. They, they see them and they still go to the prison, see if they're there. Denial, right there. We talk a lot about that in Celebrate Recovery. That sticks out to me. They're in denial about that. Anyway, but when the officers came and did not find them in the prison, duh, they saw them at the Temple Mount, they returned and reported, saying, Indeed, we found the prison shut securely and guards standing outside the doors. But when we opened them, guess what? We found no one in there. No one's inside. And that's just amazing. I mean, the angel says, Okay, guys, I'm going to let you out, but I'm letting you out for a purpose. Go do a work. Go do this work. And what do they do? The very next day, the very next morning, they go and they go to the most public place possible. They go to the Temple Mount and they begin to preach the word. Now, I don't know about you, but if this was me, I'd kind of want to lay low a little bit. Let it let kind of like the heat die down a little bit, right? I mean, maybe that's just me. Maybe I'd say to the angel, you know, angel, you know, we play, we'll do that. We're going to spread the gospel, but let, let's wait a couple of days. Let's let this cool off a little bit. We're, we're, it's kind of uh, hot right now. Let's, let's let it cool off, and then we'll do that. But that's not what they did. They went out the very next day to the most public place possible. They go to the most public place, and then the officer returns with this report. But the guards are still there, just as normal. Right at the prison door. And they open the door, and what do they find? Nothing. No apostles. They're, they're, they're gone. Where are they? You know, I think it's funny because, again, I think they're in denial. They're like, where are they? But, I mean, just look at it. Verse 24. Now, when the high priest, the captain of the temple, and the chief priest heard these things, they wondered what the outcome would be. Now, there's a lot packed into this one first, I think. They wondered what the outcome would be. What, what are we going to do? Where are they? You know, they're not, they're not in the prison where we left them. And where do they find them? They could find them teaching the people the word of God in the temple. It wasn't difficult to find them. They weren't hiding. They were right there doing what God told them to do. And then it says in verse 26, Then the captain went with the officials and brought them without violence. Notice that, without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should be stoned. Now, I think it's significant that they brought them without violence. Now, what does that mean? It means that there was no motivation for violence on behalf of these officials of the religious council who arrested them, right? And so they had no motivation of violence, but why? Well, we read here that they knew the crowd was against them. They, and I think it's kind of shameful of these men that they did not fear God. They feared the crowd, right? I mean, and I think that the fact that there was no violence is actually a special credit to the apostles. 
right? I mean, think about the fact that there was, no, there was no violence. It was a special credit to them because, and I think the reason is because they had such favor with the people that they could not easily do that to them. They couldn't easily violently take them and arrest them like they maybe did before. The, the apostles probably could have very easily, at this point, started a riot. They are about to go take them to prison. They could have said, no, we're not going to go. Look at all these people. Oh, we should just turn again. Yeah, yeah. I could just see it in my mind. There's riot happening because the apostles caused this riot. But that's not what they do. They went with them because they knew God was with them. Rather, to deliver them from this like you did before, or rather it's to help them endure in the midst of this trial. They knew God was with them. And so they can do this boldly. And so that's the point that I kind of want to conclude with this week. I mean, because I'm absolutely convinced that there's maybe some people in here this morning, their, their theology or, or practically you would doubt that miraculous things that God does and if that's you, I want you to believe that he does do powerful, miraculous things even today. Understand that the Spirit is still at work in that way. You can believe that God does powerful miracles working even today. But on the other hand, you know, I, I, I don't know who this is speaking to. And, and honestly, I don't have really have anyone specifically in my mind. So don't, don't worry. I'm not like trying to pinpoint you or anything. I don't have someone specifically in my mind when I'm saying this. But God's power is often manifested in the ordinary, right? In, in endurance through the trials, you need to look at that person who's enduring that trial, maybe even for a long time under some maybe physical trial or whatever it is. And you need to understand that God's power is at work in their lives, working in them, helping them to endure. It's not one or the other, right? You know, that person who endured for a long difficulty of suffering, whether it be unemployment, maybe it's stress, or whatever it is, God's power is very strongly and their presence with them as they endure, helping them endure. And I think that might be even more than a miraculous thing. I don't know which one you need this morning, right? I don't, I don't know what God is, is, is telling you, and, 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 but I think he's telling us to hold both of these very strongly and have an understanding of both of these. Believe that God is here today to minister to your needs. I think the greatest example of this, and I think I always want to come back to this, is this is the most important thing in the Christian life, is, the, is when I think about this, I think about Jesus dying on the cross, right? The Father gives us Jesus, the Son, and he gives them the power to endure through difficulty. He did not, he did not deliver him from the difficulty until the resurrection, but he did do that. He delivered it to, from uh, from Jesus, for Jesus, through the resurrection. He did that. And so both were at work in the glorious work of Jesus on the cross, where he paid the penalty uh, that delivered us, right? He suffered for our sins, our shame that we deserved. And so that's where our focus should be. That should be on Jesus. And we're actually going to talk about that more next week. Because a lot of times uh, there, there's a lot of noise and a lot of things that happen outside of this thought of Jesus that makes us turn against Christianity, right? And it makes us turn against Christianity, but the focus isn't on Jesus and who he is. It's focused on other people. And a lot of times people will look at Christians and say, well, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be a Christian because this person hurt me over here. But their focus isn't on Jesus. And we're going to talk about more about that next, next week. And we're going to dive into that a lot. But that's where our focus should be. It should be on Jesus. And that is the message that the disciples preached, right? And so let's pray together and ask God to, to seal these things in our heart. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I understand that these two things, your, your immediate miraculous power and the sustain, sustaining patient endurance that you give, Lord, I understand that these things are not merely intellectual under, intellectually understood, God. They have to be spiritually apprehended. And Lord, I don't know if I explained it the, the, 
I did the best I can to explain it, Lord. I don't know if I can explain it any better than I have, but Lord, the next thing is for that your spirit has to minister to our hearts. So Lord, I pray for the people who are struggling with all this this morning. I pray that you would help them, Lord, in the midst of their struggles to trust you for what they need to trust you with. If, if they should trust you with the immediate miraculous deliverance, then Lord, guide them in that way. If they need to trust you in this patient endurance, Lord, then help them to do that. Father, bring us to the place of maturity and consistency in our walk with you. Point us to Jesus who can lead us to all truth and all wisdom. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.